There was an idea to bring together a group of remarkable people to see if we could become something more. So when they needed us, we could fight the battles that they never could. Here's the thing, I was there in 2008 to see the star of the MCU. I was there, Gandalf. I was there 3,000 years ago. The film industry from a consumer and a production standpoint was completely different. There was no cinematic universes, there were no CEOs or presidents of studios laying out a decade-long plan to bewildered fans and eager executives. I wish there was a way to know you're in the good old days before you've actually left them. The original blockbuster film era was doing well, Champions of Cinema, The Dark Knight, Kung Fu Panda, WALL-E, The Hurt Locker, and many more iconic movies of that year. This was after the Raimi Spider-Man trilogy and the Fox X-Men trilogy, both of which had been highly successful, and put superhero movies on the map for mainstream audiences, yet both had underwhelming endings to their trilogy. The interesting thing though is that while both trilogies were Marvel IPs, Marvel itself was barely seeing any of that coin, due to not owning the rights to them anymore. More. While we're on the topic of coin, let me try to save you some with this video's sponsor, Atlas VPN. Now, unless some of you are secretly Tony Stark or Jeffrey Bezos, I know times are tough, money is short, and nobody is trying to lose their money. But just like Age of Ultron, these days even the internet can cause the worst day of your life. As creeps, freaks, and Frank the Deep Cover FBI agents. So, to combat these not so super villains, we've teamed up with Atlas VPN to give you a deal even Thanos would take by signing up through us for Atlas VPN's three year deal for $1.99 a month, still shorter than your average Marvel contract, mind you. You'll be given the best VPN on the market with a 30 day back money guarantee. But what is a VPN? Well, after Googling the meanings to not sound dumb in this video, mission failed, I can tell you that it's a virtual private network. And here's what it can do block all malicious links, ads, trackers, and it notifies you when someone's trying to steal your your data. I see you, Frank. I see you. It allows you to watch your favorite movies or shows from all over the world, regardless of where you live. Can't watch She-Hulk on Disney Plus? Can't watch a better show on Disney Plus? Or House of the Dragon on HBO, if Warner Brothers is still in business mind you by the time this video goes up. That's not a problem for Atlas VPN. They got you covered. Atlas VPN protects all your devices with a single subscription. It's like Wong. You can have it everywhere. Use our channel's trackable link, get.atlasvpn.com slash Cairo. The link will be down below, twice just in case you don't want to scroll up for all you lazy people like me. Thank you again for Atlas VPN for sponsoring today's video. To say that they had everything to prove and everything to lose with Iron Man in 2008, was an understatement. To put it in perspective, if Iron Man flopped, they would lose the rights to Captain America and Thor. Iron Man couldn't be functional, it couldn't be serviceable, you couldn't turn your brain off. It had to be successful. This was a job. Kevin Feige, John Favreau, Robert Downey Jr., and the entire team behind Iron Man couldn't fail at. And to their credit, they didn't. I'm just not the, the hero type, clearly. The first Iron Man movie was a sleeper hit, taking the world of comic book movies by storm. Kevin Feige had worked on many comic book films before, everything from Fantastic Four to the X-Men and Spider-Man, but this was something completely different. This is not to say the early days of the MCU were perfect. Isaac Perlmutter, former CEO of Marvel, was a notorious racist, sexist, and this was all proven thanks to the Sony leaks, creatively and ethically compromised the entire company of Marvel. Yet through all these highs and lows, we were able to get the payoff of seeing Iron Man, Captain America, and Thor in the same film together as the Avengers were formed in 2012. The premise alone of seeing live action superheroes come together carried so much of the MCU in the early days of it. It was something many comic book fans had always wanted but had never gotten close to having, besides the one time there was a planned team up between the Punisher and Spider-Man within the Raimi films. Spider-Man, your days of terrorizing the innocent are over. Don't tell me. The skull? This premise became a silent promise in the MCU that what we were getting 
had a payoff, regardless of if it was perfect or not. Marvel was delivering a premise no one else was. Through all of their victories and defeats, they kept pushing through, and all of that led them to Infinity War and Endgame, two of the biggest films in cinema history that saw the completion of multiple different story arcs that had been running for well over a decade. Despite any shortcomings of Endgame or the MCU as a whole, they managed to do what DC couldn't do with their DCEU, what Lucasfilm couldn't do with Star Wars, what no one could do at the time but Marvel Studios continuously build their brand, their franchises, their characters in an almost universally loved way that secured them, for the most part, ever-growing critical, financial, and audience success. It wasn't perfect, but it damn well did the job that no one else could do. At the end of Phase 3, despite everything, Marvel Studios had won. In comparison, many of their rivals and even sibling studios had failed. In regards to Star Wars, Lucasfilm's middle movie of the sequel trilogy saw The Last Jedi create a cultural narrative and audience divide that never healed to this day, as well as having a significant drop off from The Force Awakens financially. The Mill movie went in its own divisive and underwhelming direction for many, which resulted in the rise of Skywalker suffering greatly from Disney's panicked micromanaging and Lucasfilm's own indecisiveness on where to take the franchise after multiple creative differences with directors, thus giving an ending to the Skywalker saga that failed to meet the expectations of some or end the culture war the franchise had fallen into thanks to the Mill movie. Combined with the under performance of the Han Solo spinoff, Star Wars films had become a thing of the past, and Lucasfilm's exclusive content for the last few years and for who knows how many years to come, outside of the upcoming Indiana Jones film, is now direct to streaming content of varying levels of quality. Meanwhile with Warner Brothers, in their desperate attempt to catch up to the MCU, the DCEU self-sabotaged itself, and unlike Disney Lucasfilm, they didn't have the nostalgia or the goodwill to survive how badly they screwed up their own IP, from phasing out their lead creative film director during the worst family tragedy anyone could go through, to constantly and blatantly ripping off Marvel to the detriment of the directors they hired to bring their creative vision to life. The DCEU destroyed whatever goodwill they had from their audiences and patience from critics. As of now, they've undertaken another merger, which has only resulted in the cancellations of multiple projects, including, but not limited to, a completed Batgirl film, a Supergirl film in development, and various other animated and live action productions. This has all backfired on Warner Brothers so badly that they can only afford to release two movies by the end of 2022, one of which, Don't Worry Darling, ironically named, is self-imploding with behind-the-scenes drama and a disastrous low Rotten Tomato score, while the other one, Black Adam, Adam reaches Morbius levels of memes and impending dread. Hopefully though, it does make some money because it definitely seems like Don't Worry Darling will not be picking up the slack. Likewise, they have recently lost their long-term partnership with Legendary Entertainment, putting them at a further disadvantage. With all their rivals defeated or struggling, Marvel Studios took the throne of the number one entertainment studio. The only problem is... Heavy lies the crown. Sort of thing. There is something to be said about the difference between fighting and winning the war for the throne. The fight will be romanticized, the struggle often forgotten, and the victory will be celebrated despite any hiccups the MCU suffered on the road to Endgame. They did it. Like the original trilogy of Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, the Raimi trilogy, Back to the Future and Harry Potter, the MCU had finally had the victory that every story since Phase 1 had been building to. The problem is that the stories I listed at the time of their release date at least were the definitive ending to many of those stories. It was unheard of for a franchise to still have plans right after the grand finale, and even less unheard of for a cinematic universe to do so. In comparison, only Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, and Harry Potter have done the same thing, and all three of them did it long after their finales were over to divisive results, to say the least. For Marvel, this was completely uncharted territory. Many of the characters who had been with the MCU since day one had completed their arcs, died, or had actors who completed their contracts. Likewise, it was unknown who would be carrying the future of the MCU. From phase one to three, there there was a silent understanding that Tony Stark, Steve Rogers, and Thor Odinson were the three big lead heroes of the MCU, arguably Tony Stark being the biggest of the three, yet it was unclear who would be carrying the torches now. Spider-Man is still joint owned by Marvel Studios and Sony, which means that even if he is one of the most popular characters in the MCU, he will never be the face of it, just because that would give Sony way too much control. The great actor Chadwick Boseman sadly passed away way too soon, and there's no idea who will take up the mantle of Black Panther after him, and regardless of who does. The situation is nothing but a tragedy where there are no 
really right answers on what to do next. Captain Marvel seems to be in an odd limbo state where despite having her origin films years ago, she's largely been absent for the MCU beyond small cameos and potentially passing the torch already to, well, technically the original Captain Marvel. It's a long story. It would seem as of now, Doctor Strange will be to the multiverse saga what Tony Stark was to the Infinity Saga. This uncertainty has been a feeling audiences have felt in general throughout Phase 4, some of which feels earned, yet also forgetful of early phases. Phase 1 and 2 in the MCU were not straight lines to Infinity War and Endgame. Thanos' appearances were mean to death because they largely had no purpose beyond reminding casual audiences that yes, he did indeed still exist. He just wasn't doing anything of note or importance. It really wasn't until Phase 3 of the MCU where it actually felt like they hit their strive and they knew where they were going. However, that doesn't mean some of the criticism for Phase 4 doesn't have some legitimacy. Which brings us to our next point. Like Phase 2 of the MCU that suffered under Marvel's former CEO, Isaac Perlmutter, Phase 4 was hindered by two main things. Number 1. Former Disney CEO Bob Iger demanding more and more content for the new Disney Plus streaming app. Number 2 was a world-altering virus that had, and still does have, more variants than Loki. When the world closed down, the entire slate of the MCU changed. The original Phase 4 slate was supposed to be Black Widow, May 2020. The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, August 2020. Eternals, November 2020. WandaVision, in early 2021, Shang-Chi February 2021, Doctor Strange May 2021, Loki May 2021, Spider-Man No Way Home July 2021, and Thor Love and Thunder in 2021. So originally No Way Home was the big climactic end of Phase 4, and Love and Thunder served as a fun little one-off movie that would have been the breather film, like Ant-Man in Phase 2 or Far From Home in Phase 3. Due to the events out of Marvel's control and Disney's need to supply their ever-demanding audience, that's how we ended up with more content for the MCU than I've ever seen in any other phases. And here's the thing, Marvel's strength is having some form of connection between the stories to lead them into the next. Yet because of this production and world change, the goal wasn't about narrative cohesion, it was about trying to make sure these stories even happened, as the scripts and release dates changed extensively behind the scenes. That's not even getting into the different schedules the directors and the actors now had in their lives, in their careers, and otherwise. The dramatic shift in production, and the change in how the world of entertainment worked during the lockdown really stop the momentum of the MCU, as the stories that at worst were deemed mostly solid entertainment and at best, to quote Jeremy Johns, awesome-tacular, became almost all sloppy. Even the best of their stories suffered from the strains of filming around new health guidelines and rushed production schedules. What started as hysteria with WandaVision, as fans finally got their taste of the biggest studio returning with more content, slowly turned into frustration with Multiverse of Madness, as everyone saw the results of how Marvel was impacted by all these changes. Marvel has been often cited as having a narrative formula, and to a degree, that's true. The action set pieces that carry scenes to the next. Humor ran by middle-aged people that sometimes lands and other times feels like the hello fellow kids meme. And an insecurity to usually break tension with a joke. The real formula, however, is the production of Marvel movies. From the cameras, visuals, writers, deadlines, etc. They had it down to a science. It wasn't always perfect, but by phase 3, you could tell it was working. The problem is, with the world stopping and starting again, Disney losing Walter White levels of money, competition looking drier than Yzma from Emperor's New Groove, you're welcome for that mental image by the way, Disney needed content ASAP and Marvel Studios are their biggest hitters, so the MCU provided regardless of if everything was polished or not. And fans saw everything. Things that they either ignored or never picked up on in the past, release dates changed, productions were moved, cast, crew, and filmmakers were very vocal about how difficult productions had become, visual effects artists were being overworked, underpaid, spread too thin, writers seem to be making choices based off their own personal bias instead of working what was best for the universe, and conversations that should have been nuanced about the problems Marvel has always had since Phase 1, and the new ones that were arising in Phase 4, were turned into online viral fights by... The biggest thing that changed the entertainment industry from the years of 2008 to 2022 was that we went from social media being a thing that was mostly not taken seriously with cringe MySpace pictures and all, to this demonic presence in the world that can literally shape narratives for millions to billions of people. It is now involved in criminal investigations of everything from selling our data to propaganda. Studios invest so much time and money to win the social media game, and sometimes can still lose to a Twitter or TikTok stand account who lives on social media, or some 
some alt-right neckbeard who has never touched a maiden in his life. TikTok and Instagram influencers have replaced journalists when it comes to building and pushing narratives online. One tweet can start discourse that rages for days. Misinformation or just outright lies can spread from one misleading headline from Screen Rant or one tweet from Culture Crave that's intentionally worded to be bait engagement. Scoopers, leakers, cloud chasers are all racing to see who can dig up some hidden information first from their insider source that told them something about a film or show regardless of if it's true. Hell, you have some people who have a Patreon dedicated to just scoops that sometimes go absolutely nowhere. Everyone wants to be the next micro celebrity involved in a red carpet given a sponsorship. Today's video is brought to you by Atlas VPN. More about them at the end of the video. This has all resulted in conversations regarding films and shows becoming viral tabloid news that may or may not have any truth to them. More often than not, there is no substance to be had in these conversations other than folks trying to get their daily clout in order to build their online presence. The romanticization of early phases of Marvel from a production standpoint is completely fabricated. The MCU has always had a struggle. Phase 1 saw Terrence Howard being fired because he wanted the same salary as RDJ and Ike Perlma replacing him because in his own words, black people look alike. Edward Norton's attempt to give the Hulk more sincerity and depth resulted in him getting phased out by Ike Perlmutter again, while concepts he brought to the arc personally were still used in later installments, showing that while they claim he had no good ideas, they still used his ideas. Iron Man 2 saw Jon Favreau creatively exhausted from dealing with Disney and Marvel top executives. It got to the point that there is basically two different movies about Iron Man, one that's Jon Favreau's story and one that's basically a setup for the Avengers movie. And let's not even get into the nightmare that is Josh. Whedon. Phase 2 saw the exit of Jon Favreau after his pitch for a more somber thoughtful take on Iron Man 3 was rejected in favor of copying more of the Whedonist humor that Disney and Marvel executives wanted from the MCU. Thor The Dark World saw the exit of the original director Patty Jenkins and extensive rewrites in the original script. The Guardians of the Galaxy film had that whole writing debacle between Nicole Perlman and James Gunn. Perlman wrote the first draft of the script and Gunn added his signature creative marks to later drafts. Gunn lost the dispute and given the difference between writing quality of volume 1 and 2, it does seem like Nicole Perlman did indeed deserve her credit. We also have the firing of James Gunn for interesting reasons and considering the nature of these uh interesting reasons i'm going to leave that to someone more well someone else because i'm not getting involved in that but uh and finally josh whedon once again was well josh whedon allegations and possible legal actions are being taken in this regard so again i suggest you do your own research into this situation at your own discretion phase three was the phase where marvel was finally free of ike perlmutter and the actual golden age of the mcu began the only people who think phases one through three were perfect were the ones not paying attention but got wrapped up in the hype of phase three or the kids on tiktok twitter and youtube living in the land of revisionist history phase three still had its issues the legal hurdles of figuring out how to deal with Spider-Man through Sony because Andrew Garfield at the time was still technically Spider-Man when they were wanting to use him. Having to figure out how to handle Captain Marvel, Black Panther, and the Wasp when they were characters who were already supposed to have appearances in the early phases of the MCU, but the literal racist misogynist Ike Perlmutter, again in his own words, thought black people and women wouldn't be marketable in merchandise sales. So characters that were supposed to appear in earlier phases of the MCU were just having their debut. Then there was also the case for Black Widow who was supposed to a film a long time ago, but again, Ike Perlmutter made that a very difficult process, and in the end, Black Widow got the shortest end of the stick and didn't get her own spin-off movie until after the character had died. Yeah, I found that most fandoms operate on a different understanding of movies, shows, and all that. You have the stand level, which works on the complete bias and subjective facts, information, everything. It is just, this is what they worship and nothing else. The consumer level, which honestly is where most of the influencers and fans from the hardcore to casual are. The production level, which is based more around the process of how how these things are made, from the conception, writing, filming, reshoots, distribution, and the director to studio relationship. Looking at anything from a production level is not cash money, it's not sexy, it's not fun, because it takes away from the romanticization of what is being made, how it deals with many different contributing factors outside of the interest or even understanding of many consumers. You can't squeeze all that info, sometimes contradicting info, into a 15 second clip on TikTok with captions while some random stranger stares into your soul. Not a Twitter post with a character limit, not even a quick 10 minute video on YouTube to please the algorithm gods. By the way, to please the algorithm gods for me, how about you guys like and share the video, possibly comment on the video, would really appreciate it. Thank you.
I think an even greater problem to come from the different levels of fandoms in Marvel, and most fandoms if I'm being honest, but that's a video for a whole nother day, is the involvement of social identity in modern politics into a fandom that has been raised on mostly superficial understandings of the world, and a large population of fans who only really care about things because they seek out the culture war, or chasing the bag or trying to get another screening pass. Which I guess is the best segue to talk about my next point, which is going to be the most controversial one. I love politics in my stories, especially when it's fancy or sci-fi. The thing is about writing politically inclined stories, no matter what they are, it is a skill, a craft, something that you cannot half-ass and it takes time. Just like writing romance, action, comedy, it is not something everyone can do and furthermore, it is not something that can be superficially done. I touched on this briefly in my Falcon and Winter Soldier review. The reason I personally found that series to be disappointing across the board was not because social or identity politics were brought up in the series. In fact, conceptually, I loved that about the series. There are elements about the series that I love because of those things. It's the way those political concepts were executed though that I hated. Stories like Captain America may have elements of escapist fun, yet no matter who has held the title of Captain America, and there have been many people who have held the title, their stories are always meant to ask the hard-hitting questions and explore them thoroughly. This has been a problem within Phase 4 of the MCU. It wants to talk explicitly about serious nuanced topics like human trafficking, the objectification and weaponization of women, systematic racism, foreign and domestic politics, PTSD, identity and external crises, grief, loss, childhood abuse, mental and physical disabilities. The only thing is you can't do any of these things superficially and the MCU is usually about superficially touching on these nuanced topics, at least in phase 4. To quote a friend of mine called the C, while the MCU has the ability to be a 10 out of 10 for all their stories, many of them fall into the ranking of 6 out of 10. This isn't something you can do though when it comes to nuanced topics that don't have easy answers. We live in an age where people who barely understand the morally gray and often complicated dealings of politics take to social media to parrot whatever argument they heard from someone else. We also live in an age where people are desperate for representation after decades of being denied it. The culture war may not allow people to remember what things were like back in the day, but representation in media if you weren't a straight white man was impossible. It's a giant reason why many actors of color have only now gotten a spotlight on them even though they've been doing this for decades. Why many interesting books, comics, and characters were either stuck in irrelevancy because studios didn't want to have faith in them and take a chance in making that into a movie or show, or they had their cultural relevance watered down, or even whitewashed for the sake of making it mainstream. It's not about spitting on the past to polish the present, nor forgetting how things in the past were indeed held back by terrible people and still are now despite what their PR agencies say. The truth is this subject is one that has no winners. Evil choices were made, and choices were made because they were the lesser evil and products of their time. Nothing needs to be excused, but we do have to have a level of understanding about what happened back then and what is happening now and why things are happening now so the future can be better. And that means calling out representation and diversity that is not being done justice. And that also means not hating things just because diversity is present. It's a very complicated topic that is made even more complicated by the fact that the film industry, no matter what anyone says, is controlled by a certain number of people who have been in the industry for decades, as well as having to deal with foreign policies thanks to now theaters. It is just a complicated process that does not have a black or white solution and we all need to understand that. This is hard to do when the culture war between the alt-right and liberals restarts for every new piece of media that comes out. One side would call it woke trash and act like it's a personal war against them as they insult every aspect of that piece of media and lose any credibility as they do so. The other side will defend the piece of media with their life because it checks the correct boxes that social media tells them it should, regardless of whether or not the series or film is well written or not. Since the correct left-leaning boxes the internet tells them they are checked, narrative and production quality does not matter, and the same goes in reverse if the correct right-leaning boxes the internet says are important are checked for the other side. The culture war isn't trying to create better media, it is about being right, it's about winning against the other side. But here's the thing, Disney, Warner Brothers, Amazon, all these other studios are not hardcore liberals or the alt-right. They are whatever they need to be to make money and expand upon their empire. A movie or a show dealing with social political issues does not make it good or bad. However, to bring those topics up, they need to be written well and handled carefully because those types of stories are very dangerous if told improperly. It is even more dangerous for impressionable people to think the bare minimum, sometimes less than that, is cracking the glass ceiling or making the important questions known. It's dangerous for 
ignorant people to think the presence of these nuanced topics can't be told in fiction at all and need to be purged. These are the building blocks of the culture war. A show or a movie that's written badly that happens to feature identity politics is not bad because the identity politics are in it. It's bad because the writers are bad and even if you remove the identity politics it would still be bad because those writers are bad or they do not know how to write a story properly and are just using those as a scapegoat. Either way it will be bad regardless. Likewise a badly written show or movie is not good because it features those identity politics in it because we should not be celebrating when identity politics gets used badly. The target audience for the MCU are people who may not understand the politics of America that well on a nuanced level, even less so of the world, and even the smaller fraction of those groups know how to articulate those feelings on political issues online and on social media platforms that prioritize quick reactionary content do not help the situation. The real audience the MCU wants is the GA, casual fans. You, me, and everyone else are important in a marketing sense. Marvel learned better than other studios that if you keep your more invested online fans happy, it is an easier way to get word of mouth marketing for you. But if Marvel wants to talk about these more serious issues, it takes more risk, less superficial buzzwords, and a more mature, harder way of approaching these films. If you want to talk about these serious subject matters, you better find a way to integrate them better into the metaphors of your story, or you have to be ready to alienate more casual GA fans who don't really have an interest to see these serious topics brought up. But you can't do it superficially, you can't try to market it superficially. The only way for the culture war to finally end, at least in regards to Marvel Studios, is the same way to make Marvel better. No more half measures. Marvel Studios are not the underdogs fighting an uphill battle anymore. As much bad face criticism as they do get, they are still the number one studio on the planet that is owned by the mega corporation Disney. That being said, Marvel characters mean a lot to generations of people. Marvel Studios has made stories that have inspired millions and changed lives. Whether or not someone wants to believe that or not, they also have potential to reach the biggest audience due to their brand. The problem is Marvel Studios needs to stop pussyfooting around. No more half measures measures. These rushed productions have to stop because while diehard MCU fans and influencers will accept it regardless, Marvel Studios isn't just a comic book movie studio anymore. They are a powerhouse of the box office and entertainment industry. Fans of Marvel Studios barked at Uncle Marty's claims that the MCU and superhero movies were in real cinema. Actually, let's play the full quote so people have context behind what Martin Scorsese said about superhero films and shows and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to ask you what filmmakers and films that you've watched relatively recently that still inspire you and give you hope for the next wave of filmmakers? It's hard for me to, to keep up with a lot, but Joanna Hogg's films, for example, mm -hmm. I like uh, some of the wildness of the Ben Wheatley pictures. There are so many coming out of England, I think, Lynn Ramsey. There, there are really a number of uh, wonderful films. My, my fear, more than fear, my observation is that uh, the filmmakers of substance need support. Yeah. And the problem is um, the uh, amusement park films. The problem is that, which is something that's been pointed out for the past number of years now. But now I think, uh, in effect, uh, they, they've got real cinema on the run, so to speak. There's no, it's very difficult for films of substance or attempted, uh, how should I say, I don't want to use the word personal vision, but I have. Uh, it doesn't mean it's not entertaining, right? But uh, it, these these projects, uh, uh, where can they be shown? Mm. Where can they be shown if the theaters are taken over by the um, uh, well-made, uh, beautifully made, uh, animated pictures, in a sense, uh, you know? Uh, animated pictures. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not. I was thinking. I was saying this in, in New York, and uh, people were saying, "Well, you know, you don't like those films. It's not that I don't like them. First of all, I haven't seen many. I tried to, but I, I wasn't interested. Uh, the thing about it is that they seem to be creating. It's another form. Mm. It's another form, and their theaters were almost like amusement parks in a sense. So these films now, I think, are more like theme rides, in a way, and it's a different experience for an audience. Now, that audience could also appreciate narrative film. Mm -hmm. uh, narrative or, a narrative could be a film that could be made by the uh, the Turkish filmmaker Ceylon, or, or as I say, Joanna Hogg, uh, or, or uh, you know, uh, different types of pictures um, that don't necessarily depend on uh, heavy special effects and uh, 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 how should I put it, comic book heroes. I mean, I was told by my film professor, there are films and there are movies, and sometimes you've got to know what you're walking into. Yeah. 
See, but I come from a time where movies were films. Now, some were genre, you follow? Yeah, I do. Yet, years later, we realized, well, within the genre, mm -hmm. certain things were able to be expressed, certain uh, personal uh, style developed, not all the time, but very often. And then one could appreciate the genre for what it is. And that's what I'm saying about the, uh, the uh, theme park films. For what they are, they can be appreciated. But that's not the only thing. Yes. You follow? I and we have, it's our obligation to, to uh, try to um, make that clear. To that audience. This is not a critique on superhero stories. This is a critique on how the industry is treating superhero stories and putting less and less effort into many of them because they know, at best, as long as it is serviceable, it will still make money. So, if MCU fans and even actors in the MCU want Marvel Studios to be in the same conversation as accomplishments of cinema and television, things gotta change. The competition isn't the indecisive Star Wars or self imploding DCEU anymore. It's A24 with everything everywhere all at once, which had a better multiverse story all around. That wasn't a pun. It's HBO with somehow House of Dragons, which is killing it in the political driven storyline and has black people writing dragons. That is not an object quality, that is just me subjectively loving it, cause damn that's badass. Amazon with the boys is telling a far better superhero story that covers every single type of politics you can think of. AMC with Better Call Saul just had a legal drama show about a lawyer that raised the bar of television in general. Surprisingly somehow Warner Brothers with the Batman made a better superhero film than anything Marvel related this year and the last year if I'm being honest. From the absurd humor standpoint, you have Rick and Morty still proving it's one of the smartest ran shows out there while being just a crazy insane animated show. Just as they ran to the MCU to get movies and shows they couldn't see anywhere else, now they're running away from it because there are movies and shows doing it better than the MCU or not doing it at all. It's time for your next adventure. I have no idea what I'm going to do tomorrow. How exciting. Just as the western or crime drama was the most popular thing in western media, until eventually it dialed back from oversaturation to one-off films we'd get now and again, the superhero genre will go the same way. As Tony Stark once said, Part of the journey is the end. Eventually, in our lifetime, probably within this decade, if I'm being honest, we will see Marvel Studios start to slow down its production of movies and shows. Instead of putting out a mass amount of movies and shows, they'll put out less, focusing on quality over quantity. I've been hard on the MCU in this video, but that's because I have seen what they can do at their best. I have seen how much even the most flawed stories can mean to people, and I can only imagine what the MCU could look like if they remembered why they started. It wasn't about making an endless conveyor belt of movies, making sure they balanced out the money Disney wasn't making from Lucasfilm as they tried to find themselves for the third time in one decade. Marvel Studios was created because there was an idea, a vision, to take all the sincerity of the Raimi Spider-Man films, the Fox X-Men films, and so many other early comic book movies of the early 2000s and create something of quality to run where their predecessors walked and then eventually fly to heights no ones could have ever conceived back in 2008. It is very easy to listen to people who just don't care about quality, who just want to mindlessly consume or hate something, but the people who create the MCU did care. They loved comic book movies, despite their flaws, and they saw that they could do something with these unknown characters just like their predecessors did. The race to put out as much content as possible under a brand name is quickly fading. Movies like Top Gun Maverick, The Batman, Everything Everywhere All at Once, they show that even if the films aren't perfect, or they are perfect, the attempt to do better than the past while honoring what it did do and pushing the boundaries of quality, even if it takes longer is a better reward than relying on brand loyalty, content addicts, or hate grifters. It's the desire to do better. It's the want to do better. It's remembering why the MCU was created in the first place. It wasn't about a cinematic universe. It wasn't even about a franchise. It was about creating movies based on characters people loved and doing something astounding with them. The future for Marvel Studios can be bright, but only if they move forward. Thank you to everyone who made it to the end of this video. I appreciate you, your time, and your views. Social media accounts are down below.
If you liked today's video, how about you leave a like? If you want to see more videos from me, then hit the subscribe button. And if you want to support the channel to see more videos like this so I don't have to go back to OnlyFans, how about you become a part of our Patreon for only $1 a month? It's very cheap. You can also support us through a single donation or just leaving a comment would help the video greatly. No matter what you do, I appreciate you for stopping by and listening to me talk. Once again, a big shout out to Atlas VPN for sponsoring today's video. Thank you guys so much for doing that. Have a good day, have a good evening, and have a good night. See you next video.